It was a brutal triple murder, as unbelievable as it was strange. Today's story begins on a sweltering hot day of August 25, 2016, on Lawndale Road in Scarborough, Ontario. The neighborhood was described as an area of the city that was quiet, and nothing bad ever happened there. Until it did. This is the scene this morning here on Lawndale Road in Scarborough. You can see a forensics tent sent up on the driveway of this home. This is where one body was found. Two more were found in the rear of the property. Neighbors tell me that a mother and two growing sons lived in this home, but we don't know if they were the two males and female found dead here. Uh, this neighbor was at home about one o'clock yesterday afternoon. You said all of a sudden you heard a knock on the door. It wasn't a knock. The guy was hammering on the door. I opened the door and he practically fell into my arms, practically knocked me over. Um, he staggered into the front room and fell on the floor. And he said, call 911. My brother's bleeding in the driveway. Make sure the police come, make sure the police come. He emphasized the police. Uh, he passed out for a couple of minutes and then he came to again. You ran over to try to help, but it was yeah. too late. Yeah. Well, I, did, I couldn't do anything. The guy was bleeding too badly. I didn't want to touch him. I fear I might do more damage. When first responders arrived, they found one victim deceased in the driveway, and 35-year-old Brett Ryan was standing close to the garage, covered in blood. He was asked by police if he needed help, and he calmly replied, quote, No, it's not my blood, and there are two more in the garage. The house on Lawndale Road had a standalone garage in the backyard and the bodies of one man and one woman were found in the garage of the Scarborough home. 35-year-old Brett Ryan was taken into custody, but he wasn't charged right away. Specific details about the victim's injuries weren't released right away, only that a crossbow was found and the victims appear to have been injured by a crossbow bolt. The neighbors were both horrified and stunned. How could anyone reload a crossbow fast enough to kill three people? person who was screaming, he didn't say any words. He was just screaming and banging. And the other person came, I heard, he was telling, calm down, be quiet. That's all, the lady came running. I didn't hear the lady saying anything. It was going on for about five minutes. We're just sh shocked because it's a very quiet street. People that live on the street have been here 30, 40, 50 years. When paramedics arrived at the scene, they treated the victims for injuries believed to be from a crossbow arrow or bolt. And police confirmed they found a crossbow at the scene. All three were pronounced dead a short time later. A 35-year-old man has been taken into custody and is being treated for wounds in hospital. I've lived here for 21 years and I'm very shocked, right? To know that now, now, now it's not just guns, but now it's crossbows that we have to defend ourselves off with. It was a scary afternoon for Scarborough locals, many of them longtime residents. It's a nice area to live in. I've lived here for over 50 years. Surprised and shocked by the triple murder. Well, we locked all our doors and, you know, said, okay, the house is on lockdown right now until we know that everything's okay. With many seniors and young families filling the neighborhood. I'm not concerned for my safety, but there's a, a kid's school up here and a kid's school down here and a park in which the kids go to all the time. And so I guess as if you were a parent and you had young children, you wouldn't really want them walking out. The incident was initially reported as a stabbing. And a little more than an hour after the killings, a separate criminal investigation was taking place about 20 kilometers away in downtown Toronto on the city's waterfront. Police had responded to a possible bomb threat and dispatched the chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear team to a Queen's Key condominium building and closed the surrounding area. The street was closed off and residents were forced to evacuate the building. People in the surrounding area were warned to shelter in place until the threat was cleared around 5 p.m. that evening. And in a bizarre twist, these two investigations would be linked to the same suspect, Brett Ryan. So we begin today's story in Scarborough, Ontario, which is just east of Toronto. Historically, Scarborough has a bit of a reputation for higher crime rates, although Toronto police claim that crime in Scarborough is 3% lower than the rest of Toronto. Living in Scarborough was the Ryan family. Mom and Dad were Sue and Bill Ryan. Bill worked at the Toronto Star as a budget manager, and Sue was a homemaker who enjoyed gardening. Together, they had four sons, 
The oldest, Chris, worked as a TTC fare collector. Leland was the artistic one. He studied photography at Ryerson University and played the drums and guitar. There was the youngest, AJ, who was the smart one. He excelled in school and his parents sent him to a school for gifted students. And then there was Brett, who struggled to figure out what he wanted to do with his life. He was described by friends as the only extrovert in a family of introverts. He was outgoing, polite, and always smiling, but did go through bouts of depression, although he preferred to deal with it privately. Brett attended Sir Oliver Mowat High School, graduating in 1997. His yearbook messages were typical of any high school graduate, largely inside jokes and shoutouts to friends. After graduating high school, he enrolled in the University of Toronto, but dropped out shortly afterwards. He worked odd jobs, eventually working as a house painter full time, but was deeply in debt about $60,000 and living with his parents. He led what appears to have been a crime-free life until he reached his late 20s, when Brett ran into financial challenges due to what parole board documents call, quote, unhealthy intimate relationships. In 2007, when he was 26 years old, Brett reached his breaking point. He was stressed about money, and rather than taking up a second job, he decided robbing banks would be a better option. He would rob his first bank on October 20th, 2007. With his face wrapped up in hospital bandages and his left arm hung in a sling, he walked into the CIBC bank and handed the teller a note and said that he was carrying a gun and demanded $2,000 or more. She only ended up giving him a little over $1,000, but he got away with it and wasn't going to stop. Over the course of the next eight months, Brett robbed another 12 banks along the Highway 401 corridor and stole around $28,000. After the bandage disguise, Brett decided to change things up and purchase a glue-on beard from a costume supplier. He also wore a plaid shirt, dark jacket, glasses, and a Gilligan hat. He would tell the bank teller that he had a hidden gun, but denied actually having one after he was caught, and no firearm was ever found. At this point, he wasn't an experienced criminal. He had no criminal record, which is why it took police so long to catch him. There was even one incident where there were 25 police officers staking out banks along Highway 401, hoping to catch him in the act. But he had to have known at some point he was going to be caught. This couldn't go on forever. And after one of Brett's heists, police tracked down his truck and followed him home. The jig was up. He was under arrest and to his credit, accepted his fate and pled guilty to all the charges. When he was sentenced in January of 2009, he had plenty of support. Justice Paul Robertson noted that Brett volunteered at SickKids and refereed Little League games at his local community center. And several close friends had written letters of support and concluded that these crimes were completely out of character. At sentencing, Justice Robertson told Brett, quote, You are not a youth, but in my view, you are youthful. In all honesty, I think the judges were manipulated by his looks, in this situation and again when he was sentenced for the killings, but I'll touch on that later. Brett was sentenced to five years, but with time already served, combined with good behavior, he qualified for early parole. A psychiatric report filed in court at the time of his guilty plea stated that Brett had no history of aggression or violence. He was found not to suffer from any major mental illness, had no substance abuse or personality disorders, and did not exhibit psychopathic or antisocial traits. When he came before the parole board in 2010, he had the support of his mother and father and one of his brothers. He had an optimistic story of reconciliation, according to the National Post. He told the parole board that for the first time in years, he was actually communicating with his family. The Parole Board of Canada seemed to agree that Brett had been rehabilitated, and he was released towards the end of 2010. But now, he had made a bad problem worse for himself. He still had a mountain of debt and had to file for bankruptcy, and had trouble finding work because a simple Google search 
would reveal the truth. Shortly after Brett was released, the Ryans moved into a bungalow on Lawndale Road in Scarborough. They moved, apparently, because it bothered Sue that their previous neighbors gossiped about Brett's previous run-ins with the law. But the move was a fresh start for Brett, and he started to make changes to improve his life. He worked retail jobs and also re-enrolled in the University of Toronto, majoring in biophysics. He also started seeing a therapist, who said that it was important for Brett to be honest with the people he was closest with. In September of 2011, Brett was set up with a woman named Kristen Baxter, who was a physiotherapist. He was honest with her about his past, and I guess it didn't seem to bother her, because the two pursued a relationship, and in January of 2013, Brett moved into her condo in downtown Toronto. About one year after moving in with Kristen, Brett's father passed away and it was around this time that Brett's money issues started to surface again. He had recently proposed to Kristen and was living beyond his means. They were planning their wedding for September 16, 2016, right around the anniversary of their first date in 2011. They were going to be married at Ancaster Mill, a rustic creekside venue near Hamilton. It's a beautiful location, but definitely not cheap, with a $100 plated service per person. Brett had also planned a bachelor weekend in August with some friends at Mont Tremblant. But in 2015, he dropped out of school again and didn't tell either his family or his fiance. For the next year, they continued to believe he was still attending class. Then in spring of 2016, Brett was offered a job with a Toronto tech firm, but within days of being hired, his past had come back to haunt him. The company found out about the bank robberies from years before and rescinded the offer. But instead of being honest with his family, he kept it a secret and pretended he still had a job. During this time, Brett and Kristen were planning their wedding, and Sue Ryan really believed her son had turned his life around. But the lie was becoming exhausting for Brett. His financial situation was spiraling, and he couldn't keep things going the way they were going. So following the advice he was given by his therapist, and five days before the murders, he told his mother, Susan Ryan, that he didn't have a job and that he had lied to his fiance and that he had dropped at a university, the tech job that fell through because of his criminal record, all of it. He told her that he knew he needed to find work, but he needed help. Sue didn't mince words and gave him an ultimatum. Brett had to tell Kristen everything because if he didn't, Sue would, and she wouldn't give him any more money until he was honest with Kristen about everything. That wasn't going to happen. Brett couldn't let his lies be exposed, so he came up with a plan to silence his mother. With his wedding less than three weeks away, he worried that if his fiance found out about the deceit, their relationship would be finished. So Brett purchased a secondhand crossbow to avoid leaving a record of purchase. Because of his previous criminal record, the conditions of his sentencing made it illegal for him to own a firearm. With crossbows, people typically only buy them for deer hunting in Canada. There are no licenses required and there are no restrictions to owning one in Ontario other than you must be 18 years old. A few days after receiving the ultimatum from his mother, he stopped by her house to work on a renovation. And while he was there, he hid the crossbow in the garage. Brett and his brothers had recently renovated their mother's kitchen. The garage was still full of old flooring and all sorts of clutter. So if anyone was out there, there wasn't much of a chance they would stumble across a random crossbow. Back at the condo in downtown Toronto, Brett got hard to work at building a gadget of sorts that if all went well, would provide the perfect alibi for what would come next. The device consisted of his laptop, propped up against the wall with two five-pound weights, and a wooden spoon duct taped to an oscillating fan. He set up the fan so the tip of the spoon perfectly matched up to the laptop's enter key. The cord from the fan was then plugged into a digital timer, the kind the most Canadians use to plug in their Christmas lights. When the timer was triggered, the fan would turn and the spoon would click the enter key set to YouTube. 
He did this twice more, once with his phone and again with his tablet, plugging in fans set to digital timers and stylus pens taped to these fans that would send out pre-typed messages set to go off at various times throughout the afternoon. And all devices were set up to stay on while he was away giving the illusion that he was at home the entire time, watching YouTube and sending emails, creating a fake digital footprint. This is a massive amount of effort just to create a fake alibi. Brett clearly wasn't a stupid guy. He was creative as well as methodical. Imagine if he used all this energy for something good in the world. August 25th, 2016 was a blistering hot day in Toronto with intense humidity, yet Brett left the condo that day wearing two pairs of jeans. He brought with him his gym bag that contained a disguise. Inside were some extra clothing, a wig, a bucket hat, as well as a few broadhead bolts for the crossbow. In order for this insane alibi to work, Brett needed to leave his condo building without appearing on any of the security cameras in the elevators lobby, and parking lot. That left him with only one route, 14 flights down the stairwell and out through the back alley. There were a few cameras out there too, but he knew where they were pointed and planned a path to hide from them. When he left the alley, he headed to the GO terminal and took a train to Eglinton Station and walked 10 minutes to his mother's home. He arrived at 10 Lawndale Road around 10 a.m. Sue wasn't expecting him to show up that morning. She had just canceled her plans to go to the CNE with her neighbor Marie, as she had a cold. Brett said he hoped Sue might be able to see his point of view. But she stood her ground and promised to tell Kristen everything if Brett didn't. The argument got heated and Sue called her oldest son Chris and asked him to come over to help handle his brother. Brett quickly realized the situation was spinning out of control. This should have been the time he backed out of the plan completely, but he didn't do that. Instead, he marched out the back door and headed straight for the garage, with Sue following him. This next part is not for the squeamish, so if you want to fast forward a little bit, I completely understand. Crossbows are not easy to load, and with only a few steps between the house and the garage, Brett didn't have enough time to cock the string and fit a bolt into place before his mother entered the garage. Instead, he grabbed a broadhead bolt and stabbed her in the cheek and the ear. And then he wrestled her to the ground and took a piece of yellow nylon rope and strangled her until she died. After Brett stabbed and strangled his mother to death, he set about cocking the crossbow. He knew his brother Chris was on his way and he needed to be prepared. When Chris walked into the garage, Brett creeped up quietly behind him and fired at close range. Brett barely had to squeeze the trigger. All it needed was a light touch and his brother died immediately. Brett grabbed his brother's body and stacked it on top of his mother's body behind the pile of hardwood flooring and then draped a tarp over top of them. If he had time, he could have stuffed his bloodied outer jeans into his gym bag and put on the wig and the Gilligan hat he had packed for this situation. But before he could do any of that, his younger brother AJ arrived home. Brett exited the garage and met AJ on the walkway leading to the back door. He was carrying another crossbow bolt in his fist. By this point, he realized he had gone too far down this nightmarish path not to see it through. Brett stabbed AJ in the neck with a bolt and he collapsed onto the driveway. Meanwhile, Brett's third brother Leland had been napping in his bedroom. He had seen Brett earlier, but didn't see it as suspicious. Brett was always stopping by the house, so this wasn't unusual. Until he heard a blood-curdling scream coming from outside the house. Leland ran outside to see what was going on when he found his younger brother bleeding on the ground outside the garage. Leland's first instinct was to help AJ and call 911. He at first thought AJ had accidentally hurt himself. At this point, Leland had no idea that his mother and his brother's body are under a tarp in the garage. 
He just sees that his brother is severely injured and wants to get him help. But Brett was behaving strangely and actually tried to convince Leland not to call for help. When Leland ran to the phone to call 911, Brett followed him into the house and attacked him to get rid of any witnesses according to court records. What followed next was a horrific struggle for survival. The two brothers stumbled violently throughout the house, down the hallways and into two different bedrooms, fighting and kicking over furniture as they went. Brett even put Leland in a chokehold. They snapped an end table and threw each other against Leland's bedroom door. Brett was soaked with the blood of his family members and Leland sustained a head wound and bled profusely. As they fought, they left a trail of blood on the walls, the floors, and the ceilings. Leland thought Brett was going to choke him out and kill him, which probably would have happened had he not gotten away. Leland fled the house and ran across the street to get help from his mother's friends, Warren and Marie. He pounded on the door and when Warren answered, Leland almost fell on top of him. This is the scene this morning here on Lawndale Road in Scarborough. You can see a forensics tent sent up on the driveway of this home. This is where one body was found. Two more were found in the rear of the property. Neighbors tell me that a mother and two growing sons lived in this home, but we don't know if they were the two males and female found dead here. Uh, this neighbor was at home about one o'clock yesterday afternoon. You said all of a sudden you heard a knock on the door. It wasn't a knock. The guy was hammering on the door. I opened the door and he practically fell into my arms, practically knocked me over. Um, he staggered into the front room and fell on the floor. He said, call 911. My brother's bleeding in the driveway. Make sure the police come, make sure the police come. He emphasized the police. Uh, he passed out for a couple minutes and then he came to again. The police were called and homicide detectives were immediately on the scene. Brett, in the meantime, returned to the front stoop and waited for the police to arrive. Brett then sent the following email to Kristen that read, quote, I'm so sorry I've destroyed everything and everyone. I've been hiding a terrible secret, my antisocial personality disorder. I couldn't control it. I wish I could make it make sense. I can tell you more when I see you. This was a strange text because previously Brett had no prior major mental illnesses other than depression or substance abuse disorders or psychopathic traits. At the same time, this guy strangled his mother, shot one brother in the head with a crossbow, stabbed another brother in the neck, tried to murder another brother, and was completely calm when the police arrived, even though he was drenched head to toe in his family's blood. And then there was everything else he methodically did and planned. I mean, his bachelor party was scheduled the day after the murders occurred. Let's just say, hypothetically speaking, his alibis worked and he got away without suspicion. Was he really going to go on a bachelor party weekend away right after his entire family was slaughtered with a crossbow? And then his wedding was only a few weeks away. Was he seriously planning on continuing with wedding plans as if nothing ever happened? Paramedics were dispatched at 1257 in response to multiple traumas. And although they tried to administer CPR to AJ, it was too late. At this point, police thought they were dealing with a stabbing incident, which is bad enough, but no one was prepared for the carnage they were about to walk into and that a crossbow was involved. Detective Sergeant Mike Carbon of the Toronto Police Homicide Unit responded to the scene. When uh, the officers arrived, they found the lifeless body of uh, three individuals. Uh, at this time also, the officers took one other individual into custody. At this point, as you uh, can uh, well imagine, uh, we're about four hours into the investigation. There's a lot of things that we still have to learn. Uh, there isn't a lot of information that I can give you at this point other than to say that uh, we have one person in custody and uh, we still have a lot of work ahead of us. I can say that another person was taken to the hospital. I will not discuss their relationship at this Thanks. time. We still are in the process of notifying next of kin. Uh, I certainly would not release uh, any information other than to say that, uh, that uh, uh, there is another person who was at the hospital. I won't discuss uh, what, if any, injuries that person has. 
but uh, that's as far as I'll go. Standing close to the garage was Brett Ryan, and he was covered in blood. A police officer asked him if he needed help, and Brett replied, quote, No, it's not my blood, and there are two more in the garage. As Mike Carbon entered the garage, he found two more people without vital signs and saw that they were stacked on top of each other and hidden under a tarp. As the investigation progressed throughout the day, police said they found the crossbow and other items on the property that could have been used as weapons. Autopsies were performed on the three deceased individuals, which I'd like to share with you at this time. The cause of death of the woman found in the standalone garage was ligature strangulation. The cause of death of the man found in the standalone garage was crossbow bolt stab wound to the neck. The cause of death of the man located on the driveway was a single arrow head stab wound to the neck. Today, and my message and my appeal to you is to have uh, the public know and, and um, advise us if they had any contact with this individual by the name of Brett Ryan, um, between uh, 7.30 and 11.30 a.m. on the 25th of August, 2016. In the end, it was obvious that the murders were planned and deliberate. Shortly after Brett was apprehended, the media announced that there was a connection to a suspicious package found downtown and a triple murder in Scarborough. While the murder investigation was on its way, Toronto police entered Kristen's condo that she shared with Brett Ryan. They at first went to check on her. She wasn't there and they were unable to get in touch with her at first. Considering the mess they were dealing with in Scarborough, they were worried. When they entered the condo, they discovered the homemade alibi devices that Brett made. Unsure of what to make of them, they evacuated the entire building until they could figure out what they were dealing with. The team unplugged the fans and removed the styluses before the timers were activated. They also said the devices were functioning properly and would have worked if they hadn't disassembled them. Their report contradicted Brett's version of events. He told prosecutors that he experienced a change of heart after assembling the alibi devices and that he hadn't activated them before leaving the house to confront his mother. Brett hired John Rosen, the Toronto criminal lawyer known as Mr. Murder, who had a long track record of defending accused killers, including Paul Bernardo. He waived his right to a standard preliminary hearing and pled guilty. He was convicted of second-degree murder in the death of his mother and claimed that during their argument, he went to get the crossbow from the garage to threaten her not to kill her. He also pled guilty to first-degree murder for Chris's death, since he hid and waited for his brother to arrive before executing him. At his sentencing, Brett addressed the court as he sniffled through his tears. Quote, I can only say how sorry I am for what I've done. The time now doesn't belong to me, but I'll make the most of every opportunity I'm afforded. To everyone, for all of this, I'm very sorry. As Justice John McMahon outlined the reason for his sentencing, he expressed admiration for Brett's presentation in the court. He determined that Brett was not just the author of this tragedy, but one of its victims, a good man who had done something extraordinarily heinous. Justice McMahon concluded that Brett had been caught up in a simple web of lies. Quote, I have no hesitation that Mr. Ryan is remorseful for his actions. And to that I say, what a crock of shit. This guy is a vicious triple murderer and is only sorry he got caught. Between his previous bank robbery crimes where he planned out elaborate disguises and the steps he took in this case, he planned the murder, bought a used crossbow, paid cash for it, created a fake digital alibi and setting up all those devices, made sure to avoid the security cameras, wore multiple layers of clothing during a massive heat wave, and packed a disguise. He did everything possible to try not to get caught. Things didn't go according to plan, obviously, and he failed miserably, but these are not the actions of a good man who was caught in a web of lies. And for what? 
He did this all apparently because he was afraid of losing Kristen, but he lost her anyway, as well as his entire family and his freedom for at least the next 25 years. Brett received concurrent life sentences for each of the murders, plus 10 years for the attempted murder of Leland. He will be eligible to apply for parole in 2041, when he is 60 years old. The aftermath of this entire mess has left the people who knew Brett Ryan completely stunned. They didn't see this coming at all. As a person, he was dependable and well-liked. But I guess they couldn't see this coming because he had been lying to them as well. About school, his job, everything. Everything about Brett Ryan was just one giant lie. Thank you so much for watching and taking the time to hang out with me today. If you enjoyed learning about this case, please be sure to like and subscribe. If there's a case you would like me to cover for a future video, let me know in the comment section down below. To support my channel, you can go to buy me a coffee if you would like to donate. Thanks again, and I will see you next time.